When we hold on to grievance and pain from the past, we keep ourselves from being able to really move into our fullest expression of self. We need to practice forgiveness from the soul recovery perspective, dissipating the energy and releasing the past for good. If you're interested in this profound transformation, I invite you to join me in Colorado the weekend of June 8th and 9th to have an incredible experience with others on this same soul recovery journey. Two full days of immersion in the soul recovery process where you will indeed leave transformed. You will be able to truly let go of these old pains and step into a new way of being. Check out the show notes for a coupon code and how to register. Welcome to the Recover Your Soul podcast. This is Reverend Rachel Harrison, and I'm so grateful that you're here today. I wanted to share some of the Al-Anon book studies that were part of my bonus episodes for Apple subscribers and Patreon members with our general community. This is really important because so many of you come to this podcast because you are dealing with somebody in your life who has an addiction, that it has affected you in a negative way. What I did for these seven episodes is I read out of how Al-Anon works for families and friends of alcoholics on a variety of different topics. And so each week for the next seven weeks, I'm going to go ahead and post those for everyone. I hope that you enjoy them. And if you want more of what these types of episodes offered you, I encourage you to become a Patreon member or an Apple Podcast subscriber. Thank you for supporting the Recover Your Soul podcast. My name is Reverend Rachel Harrison, and this is the Recover Your Soul podcast, a spiritual path to a happy and healthy life. I started Recover Your Soul after having profound changes in my life from my recovery of alcoholism, control addiction, and codependency. I was guided to share the tools and principles of spirituality and soul recovery to help others transform their lives as mine was transformed. For us to overcome external circumstances, we must first turn the attention to ourselves, focusing on inner change. Outer positive results in our lives will follow. As a spiritual coach, I can support you on your path to make real changes that will bring you a life of peace, happiness, connection, and abundance. Visit the website recoveryoursoul.net to book coaching sessions, read the blog, listen to some of my original music, and subscribe to receive email updates. I think of Recover Your Soul as a community. Follow us on social media and join the private Facebook group to support each other and connect. For an extra episode each week and to support this podcast, become a Patreon member or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul. Welcome back to the subscribers of Apple Podcasts and Patreon members. You are here listening to this episode because you have made a decision to support this show and to support me, Reverend Rachel Harrison. And I thank you. Thank you for that. And so we are going to do this deep dive into the extra bonus content, and I'm just going to get started. So we are doing a book study on how Al-Anon works for families and friends of alcoholics. And we have studied the power of attitude, gratitude and expectations, serenity and the serenity prayer, forgiveness, treating ourselves well, physically, mentally, emotionally, communication, recognizing old patterns. And today we're continuing on chapter 13 in communication on page 94. And we're coming to the end of this particular book study that we've been doing. And this is going to be the last episode on this for a while. There's a lot more to this book. If you are interested in this book, I would highly recommend you get it either from an Al-Anon meeting or you can get it from Amazon. There's a lot more to it. But I feel like for where we are in soul recovery, we have completed what we need And the whole rest of the book has really profound stories from other people sharing their inspiration, strength, and hope. And the beginning of the book is really great for explaining about Al-Anon, the 12 steps, and how it relates to Al-Anon. So really good information if you don't already have it. But we're going to continue on with the communication piece. And I think this is so essential because communication with other people is how we connect or don't connect, right? And we want connection in our lives. That's what we're looking for. 
I kind of glanced over the how we say it because we were going long last episode, how we say what we say. So I'm just going to read this section kind of quickly because I feel like I didn't want to totally bypass it. So I'm going to pick up on how we say what we say. It reads, but not all of our communications determined by what we do or do not say. It also depends on how we say it. Not only our choice of words, but also our attitudes, facial expressions, tone of voice can either open a channel or slam a door, regardless of the subject being discussed. All people, from the cashier at the drugstore to our children, deserve courtesy. Any message can be conveyed with courtesy, even ones of outrage. I have found that to be true. If we treat people well when we speak what is in our minds and hearts, they are much more likely to hear what we have to say. This reminds me of the saying that people don't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel. They remember how you made them feel. And that comes from us expressing things from kindness and how we use our facial expressions, how we use our attitudes, so much of how our body language is. We want them to feel a certain way. It goes on to read, this takes courage. It's much easier to let our words convey compliance while our tone of voice expresses contempt. This is a way of communicating anger without taking responsibility for it. Instead, we have the option to say exactly how we feel as with as much respect as we can muster. We are apt to get better results this way, and even if we don't, we will know that we have behaved with integrity. As we become the kind of people we can admire, we learn more appropriate ways to express our thoughts and feelings. I'm glad I read that because I think that's really important. I know that I have said one thing, but really inside I mean something else. And people can pick up on that. Or you've heard somebody say something and they're giving you words that are certain words. Maybe they're good words, but underneath you don't feel that from them. So we want to be living in a place that is coming from integrity of this clean energy that we're working on and developing in ourselves by letting go of all of the resentments and anger and frustration and contempt for other people that were thought that we needed to have. We're letting that go. So we're really working on being clear about how we say what we say. So now I'm going to read the section on listening. Of course, communication is a two-way street. Not only is it important to improve the way we express ourselves, but we must also examine the way we allow others to express themselves. We needn't always respond to what is said, nor accept everything we hear as truth, but we do hope to develop relationships in which all concerned can be themselves and say what is on their minds and in their hearts. Are we good listeners? Do we grant other people the time to say what they need to say or clarify their thoughts, even to say things we don't like to hear? Or do we interrupt, finishing other people's sentences for them, or stop listening altogether while we prepare our response? Are we open-minded about what others have to say, or do we quickly become defensive? Most of us find that if we want others to hear what we have to say with courtesy, we must extend the same consideration to them. This is so huge. And I was thinking for myself that my listening skills have really improved over my soul recovery. And they've improved in so many different areas. But part of what I've really worked on, part of what I've been really conscientious of, is that for a long time, while somebody else was talking, I wasn't really listening as deeply as I could have. I was either already formulating my response of how I was going to defend myself or that I felt like I needed to say something that was going to solve a situation or that I was going to fix something or I was going to point something out or I was going to express my opinion or I was in the place where I was interrupting and that I was constantly not even letting them finish their thought because I, I needed to say what I needed to say right away for fear that I would forget it or that, that it would get lost. 
And what I've realized as I've come through this process with myself is that I didn't actually hear a good portion of what people were saying. I wasn't taking it in. My mind was already working to process my part. I wasn't just listening. And one of my early episodes way back in season one is about this active listening and the connecting with people that we're looking for from changing the way that we interact with people. And I read this book that really talked about men and communicating with men that as women, we just want to be listened to and that men come and they try to fix us, that they want to solve the problem, but that women don't actually allow men to complete their thoughts either. And so then they get frustrated and generally defensive or feel like we're not supporting what's going on with them and it creates this conflict. So as I've done this work and I've really recognized this to be true in my life, I've worked on my skill set of listening and it has not always been easy because I still have a piece of me that wants to jump in for a multitude of reasons. And some of them are great reasons. But the more that I actually listen, the more that I actually stop my mind from the chatter that's trying to pre-think of what I'm going to say next and just be present for somebody, a real connection happens. And what I also have recognized is that Other people, if you give them the space to work things out for themselves, to use you as a safe sounding board, they begin to have the safety to say out loud what's going on with them and to be able to start to process their lives without your need to fix or control it or to let them have a rant Let them be pissed off. Let them be out of control. Let them be irritated with people. And to have that part of ourselves, as we've talked about, that detachment, that healthy detachment that can listen to that information without having that information come in and just take us over. And that we feel like we have to physically, personally, emotionally, mentally take it on to ourselves as if it is our own. So this listening skill, this allowing people to say what they need to say, even when it's something that we don't want to hear, to really have an open mind to let somebody share something that might even be hard to hear, that we can have compassion for ourselves first, listen to the situation, and instead of immediately coming from our attack mind, come from a more tender place, a kinder place to ourselves first and give ourselves credit for being willing to listen and then be mindful of how that's coming out the other side about what you have to say about it. And you might surprise yourself. You might surprise yourself at how you can actually hear stuff that you didn't think you wanted to hear. And you don't have to take on other people's emotions, but we all need to be able to express ourselves honestly and clearly. And the more that we do the listening and the speaking with a more intention, with more courtesy, with more kindness, with more awareness of the words that are coming out, the more safety there is for us to actually communicate what's really going on with us. And the more healing that happens in the relationship and that then can happen for ourselves. So it goes on to say, But being a good listener is more than just a matter of courtesy. Al-Anon's slogan, Listen and Learn, reminds us that if we have the self-discipline to be quiet and pay attention to others' words, we can learn a tremendous amount about ourselves and our world. That's the last line of that. We have the capacity to listen. And most of us, including me, We come from a paradigm of childhood where we've had to defend ourselves. We have these patterns and these blocks that we set up to keep ourselves safe when we were younger or to defend ourselves. And that's what childhood is. That's how that goes. 
So instead of judging it, instead of coming back and and being hard on yourself or being hard on the other people, can we have compassion and can we have an openness that understands that all of us are coming from this paradigm, this construct of previous experience and fear of hurt again, fear of disappointment, fear of abandonment, fear of not being enough, fear of not being loved. Generally, we're all coming from this place of those fears, those basic fears, not being loved, not being enough. And we're all communicating from that place. And so I know for me, one of the situations that I have is that Rich and I, we tend to be saying the exact same thing, like literally the exact same thing, but from different perspectives. And we can't hear that the other person is saying the exact same thing. We can't listen to that because we are in our own construct of how we personally see it or want it to be said. And we're way better at it now than we used to be. Way, 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 way better. But I still recognize that when things get tense with us, when we have those moments where we're bumping up against each other, so often it's not a big, huge deal. It's not this enormous conflict. It's that we're not observing really what the other person is saying because we're coming from how we want the other person to say it or how we want the other person to view the situation, even if the final result is the exact same thing. Being a good listener and that keeping your mouth shut, not to be small, not to be quiet, but to really allow somebody the space to talk, it really is a tool and a gift that opens up so much more. And it doesn't mean that the other person's going to respond in exactly the same. That it doesn't mean that when you make these changes that immediately somebody else then makes the changes. We have to start with ourselves first and be able to then communicate to somebody else. I'm really working on this. I'm going to make a commitment that I'm not going to interrupt you. And maybe you even set a timer. We had to do this when Rich and I first got sober. We had to set a timer and we were taught this by a friend who really helped us five minutes a piece. And in those five minutes, the other person could not say anything. And she gave us each a sheet of paper so that if you had some thoughts, you could jot it down really quick so you could come back to it. And then we've worked on that. And sometimes we ebb and flow out of how good we are at it. But it's always in my mind to really have this be a practice that allows somebody else to speak clearly and cleanly so that I can do the same on my end. The next section is called focusing on ourselves. Our goal is to build healthy, respectful relationships. By applying the Al-Anon slogan, let it begin with me, we can see that it's not good enough to wait for others to treat us well before we are considerate of them. Most of us find that after a while we begin to attract what we give out. If we are consistently warm and respectful, we tend to attract the respect and warmth from others. It may not take the form that we expect or come from everyone we encounter, but if we focus on ourselves, choose behavior we feel is appropriate, and let go of the results, and let go of the results, our communication as a whole is bound to improve. Isn't that amazing? And I think what I get out of that really is that part that we in soul recovery are keeping the focus on ourselves and that just because we're making the changes, it is going to reflect and and be out in the world to come back to you in positive ways. But we have to let go of our expectations of what those results look like and who that is going to come from, because then we're still holding on to control. We really, if we can, just keep the focus on ourselves. How are we doing the work? So the last part of this section is dealing with conflict. It says, does this mean that we never engage in arguments? Of course not. Conflict is part of every relationship. In fact, the more we recover, the more likely we may be to encounter conflict. We're bound to have increasingly strong opinions and stand up for them because we believe in ourselves. Arguments can be constructive experiences that help to clear the air, or they can be brutal attacks that undermine the connection between two people. 
The choice is ours to make. We can argue in order to win, to exert power, to prove the other person is wrong, and to mete out punishment for any slight we may have perceived, or we can argue for the purpose of making peace. Few of us look forward to disagreement, much less an argument. But when faced with conflict, we have the option to embrace it, realizing that we're each doing the best we can. And we can accept our differences. We can even accept that not all conflicts can or should be resolved and allow ourselves and others the right to do, think, and say whatever each believes without demanding agreement or resolution. That is a really big one. Keeping in mind the fact that arguments are not the only option available when a conflict arises, we can engage in discussions that permit both parties to air their views and learn from the other side. As we learn to exchange and build upon our ideas, we develop the ability to work together towards common goals and to interact with each other in a more intimate, more meaningful way. We can treat each other with respect, especially when we disagree. When I was growing up, I was raised without parents that ever fought. I was, as you know from my previous episodes, I was a good girl from the very beginning. Something in me knew that was my role. And so I didn't do very much to get in trouble or to have have any conflict. And so because there was so little conflict that happened in my life, I didn't actually know how to handle it. I didn't know or understand the value of having disagreements because to me, if I was to have a disagreement, if I was to have argued about something, something in me early on felt like I wouldn't be loved, that I wouldn't get what I needed. And those messages that we get are so, they're elusive, You know, some people have these very distinct stories of having a very particular moment where they did or said a certain thing and a adult figure reacted to them in a very specific way that created the feeling in them that they had to behave a certain way to be loved or accepted or safe. And then for a lot of us, it's just little, little things, little nudges, little approvals, little things along the way that we learn how to be trained to act and feel and behave a certain way. And so for me, conflict was not in the picture at all. And Rich has said many times that that actually was not healthy in the sense that I didn't know what to do with it. I really thought that if we were fighting, that I had to close my heart, that It meant that it was all over, that I wouldn't be loved, that it would destroy everything. I think what I've learned is that arguments can be a constructive experience to help clear the air. They don't have to be these brutal attacks that undermine the connection between people. But it comes from where inside of us we are centering our agenda in it. Can we come from a place of curiosity of what is going on for the other person, or are we just in pure defense mode? Do we have all of our weapons and we're on a battlefield, or are we in a place of curiosity and questioning and strength to have an opinion, but to not be forcing the other person to have to come around to think and feel and believe like we do? And these are really hard skills to have. And they're hard skills to have out in the world right now with the divisiveness that is created through social media. But in your intimate relationships, in the relationships with the people that you care about, what you want to be working on is the ability to have everybody have a voice. And it doesn't have to be an angry, aggressive voice. Sometimes intense energy is part of it. And I think about the animal kingdom and how there are these struggles for power and that the silverback gorillas and how they defend or how they they work with each other to sort of puff up who they are, but it creates an understanding in the way that they work. 
And I don't think that that means that every family has to have these, you know, raging conflicts, but there are some families that are just intense in how they express themselves. And I was always amazed to show up around people who had these intense expressions and could have these intense debates about subjects and raise their voices and even feel like they were upset with each other. But the truth is they weren't that they were allowing each person to have their, their style, their interaction, their intensity. And then in the end, it was like, oh, it's all good. And it was fine. My mind was blown. And I still am not somebody who enjoys conflict. I still really have a hard time in my body with the energy of it. However, I have gotten much better at understanding the value of dealing with conflict and that it's okay to have moments where you have this energy and you can bump up against each other and you can have these intense feelings. Something may happen that brings up a lot of feeling and we're not trying to dampen that down. We're not trying to make it so that you push everything down. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Sometimes everything's not fine. Your kids may be behaving in a way that you love them, but the behavior is terrible. Can you separate out those conversations to be able to let them know that you love them and that this behavior is unacceptable? And to be able to have the conflict and the strength and the boundaries and the rules that come with having to enforce what happens with teenagers. Can you have a discussion with your husband that expresses the depth of devastation or loneliness or isolation or abandonment that you feel from a situation without attacking him, with just sharing what's going on in your heart? was sharing, I feel this. I recognize that these feelings are coming up for me because I had these experiences prior to. And can we play a game that isn't a winner takes all? Can we play the game where it's about everybody wins? We're not taught in society to be open to everybody having success in the end. We're really taught that there should be somebody who is right and somebody who is wrong. If we are in soul recovery, what we're understanding is that doesn't even exist. There literally is no such thing as someone being right and someone being wrong because we all come from our own unique perspectives. We are all coming from a place of awareness and learning and growing And sometimes we're doing it really well, and sometimes we're not. But in soul recovery, we're becoming more aware of each of those interactions, and we're taking responsibility for ourselves and how we listen, how we speak, how we deal with conflict. Not about how the other person does it, but how we personally can choose happiness, we can choose peace, we can choose calm, We can choose kindness. We can choose compassion. We can choose courtesy. We have control of ourselves. We are taking our power back. So that is the end of what we're going to do for this book. I don't know what we're going to do next Friday. I'm excited to figure that out. I thank you so much for spending your time with me. Thank you for supporting the Recover Your Soul podcast and this mission I have to create this community. Without you, it doesn't happen. So thank you for your support. If there's additional support that you want to offer, please go to the website, make a donation. It really is making a huge difference. And I thank you for allowing me to do this work now full time. It is through your support that this is happening. Thank you for being with me. Until next time, namaste. Are you wondering, how do I go deeper on my path to soul recovery? Or how do I support this great podcast? Well, here's how. Here's your call to action. If you're ready for real inner change and would like to work directly with me, visit the website and book a coaching session. I'm here to support you on your unique path. I'm here to help you let go of the past, to deepen your connection with your higher power, whatever that is for you, and to discover and then step forward into a happy and healthy life. 
can also become part of our soul recovery community. One way is to join the support group. It's the first Monday of every month. It's by Zoom from 6 to 7 p.m. Mountain Time, and you can register on the website to get your Zoom link. Recover your souls on social media. Of course, there's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, lots of ways to connect, and there's even a private Facebook group that will allow for more communication and conversation about soul recovery. There is also an extra bonus episode every Friday if you are an Apple Podcast subscriber or Patreon member. I'd also love all of the listeners to subscribe on the website so that I can keep you informed on what's going on with the podcast, the community, with me, and anything that's up and coming and new and great about soul recovery. Also, if you just take a little bit of time to give me five stars, a quick review, and to share the podcast with your friends and family, we're helping even more people to have soul recovery in their lives. If this podcast is providing you spiritual nourishment and inspiration, thank you, thank you for going to the website and pushing the donate button, whatever donation feels right to you. This means so much to me because I have this enormous mission of sharing soul recovery with the world and your donations, your bookings, your subscriptions, your being part of this community is helping that to happen. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul. The Recover Your Soul podcast and its content is for educational purposes only and is not allied or representative of any organizations or religions. It's based on the opinions and experience of Reverend Rachel Harrison. Recover Your Soul claims no responsibility to any persons or entity for any liability, loss, damage, or cause alleged to be caused directly or indirectly as a result of its use. Applications or interpretations of the information represented herein. Take what you need and leave the rest.